So, what is in the blogs, right? So how do we tell whether we're just being served up a load of old rubbish or whether there is actually something new and interesting and different here? So we have to take a little pause to look at that for a moment and answer that question, right? So we need to have a little mental model. Now, I'm with Simon on this. So Simon said... Uh, we need to abstract away from uh, getting too caught up in whether it's the blockchain or a blockchain. We need a better taxonomy, a higher level taxonomy for this. So we're going to use the shared ledger taxonomy, which actually I developed with Richard Brown from R3 and Sally Parulava. So, so I want you to think of the shared ledger in a layered model, right? If it, if it really is the IP of the internet, then these layers will work okay. So here's my layered model of a shared ledger, right? So we have the communications layer at the bottom, which moves all the transactions around. We have a content layer, which is where we put whatever it is, the Honduran land registry or salad oil or whatever else it is we're putting on our blockchain. Then we have a consensus layer, which helps us to agree what the immutable record is. And of course, the construction recapitulates that consensus. And then on top of that, we have the contract layer, which, as was pointed out to you earlier on, uh, isn't, isn't really contracts. And I hate using the word contract because they're not contracts but they begin with C. And if I have everything beginning with C, then it's easier for you to remember all of these things. I understand marketing. I understand the marketing of these things. Four Cs, much easier to remember. But there's a slightly different way you could partition this in your head. So you could imagine that those lower three layers form essentially a new kind of computer that we haven't seen before. So we'll label this the consensus computer. Right? So now we have this special new kind of computer that's running on lots of other physical computers uh, and some of them are up, and some of them are down, and some of them are off, some of them are, and it doesn't matter, because we've made this sort of giant computer that everybody's sharing, and I'm going to call that the consensus computer. And on the consensus computer, just as on a general purpose computer, the thing that makes it fun is the fact you can run different applications on top of it. The same is true of the consensus computer. So what we run on top of it are these consensus applications, which is a much better word than smart contracts, and a much more accurate description of what these things are. So we have a consensus computer, and we're running some consensus applications on it. Now, what taxonomy does that? That gives us a logical taxonomy. If you just take the communications layer and the consensus layer, oh, sorry, I'll just talk about one more thing, uh, just to echo what Gideon said uh, earlier on. Um, I'm particularly interested in the robustness down at the communications layer. One of the reasons why you might want to use um, some form of shared ledger rather than a database, even though a database would be a perfectly good way of fixing something, there is this robustness argument, which is undeniable. And the example I, I like using for this is, um, is Bank of England RTGS, because Bank of England RTGS, real-time gross settlement, Bank of England RTGS is to a first approximation the UK economy. That is the British economy. You know, that every single day, that's all the payments into bank go through RTGS, right? That's the systemically most important computer system in the UK financial services industry. That is money, no object, no expense spared on RTGS. That's the British economy. And the reason why the Bank of England had that report saying they were looking at shared ledgers, RTGS has been down twice in the last five years. And once it was down for eight hours. So you had, you had people running around with bits of paper saying, here's, here's a million quid from Lloyds Bank to NatWest. Right? Actually, on pieces of paper, they had to do that. So even a system like that can go down. So when you start talking about CETA databases and stuff like that, um, you, you need to connect this with what Gideon was saying earlier on. I don't want to talk about the other things, I mean, we haven't got time. <coughs> OK, so that takes us to the taxonomy. So I can construct a very simple, very usable taxonomy of shared ledgers just by asking questions first at the communications layer, then at the consensus layer. So at the communications layer, we say, can everybody use it? If everybody can use it, it's a public ledger. If only some people can use it, it's a private ledger. It's not too technical for you, is it, at the moment? Is we? Okay, all right, good. So, uh, so we, that gives us public and private, right? So now we go down to the next layer, the consensus layer. So we say for a private ledger, okay, so if, uh, if only people in this room are allowed to use the ledger, so not everybody in the world, just the people in this room, but does everybody in this room get to take part in the consensus forming process? So if everybody in the room gets to take part in the consensus forming process, then we call that a permissionless ledger. But if only some people in the room get to take part in the consensus forming process, or some people get more votes than other people, or only rich people get votes, or only the boss gets a vote, or the boss's vote counts twice, whatever else, that's a double permission ledger. Because you need permission to access the ledger, and you need permission to take part in the consensus forming process. 
Conversely, when you have a public ledger, you ask a slightly different question, because instead of saying who takes part in the consensus forming process, in the public ledger it could be everybody, you have to ask a slightly different question, which is why would they take part in the consensus forming process? Because it's the tragedy of the commons. If everybody can take part in the consensus forming process, well, why, would I, why don't I just let them do it? As an why would I spend any effort at all myself on taking part in that consensus forming process unless I was a crook? If I was a crook, I've got every incentive to take part in that consensus forming process. All your Bitcoin will belong to mine, right? But if I'm not a crook, I need to be incentivized. And you can incentivize me in two ways. You can incentivize me with mechanisms like money, for example. That tends to work quite well in banks. But of course, if you can give me money for taking part in the consensus forming process, you can also withdraw it. So if I form consensus and you say, wait a second, I didn't want you to include that asset on the ledger. I didn't want you to include that transaction. I, therefore, I'm not going to pay you. We don't want that if we're pure of heart. So therefore, we want rewards that are part of the ledger itself that are intrinsic and cannot be censored. So if everybody can take part in the consensus in, uh, in uh, the ledger, it's a permissionless ledger. If everybody can take part in the consensus forming process, it's a double permissionless ledger, right? So that gives us four kinds of ledgers that will map to what you saw Simon present this morning. That gives us four different kinds of ledger that we can think of. That's good enough at the management level for thinking about how we're going to fix the problem. So if we look down here and we say, OK, well, the double permission ledger, that's the kind of R3 quarter sort of thing. The double permissionless ledger, that's Bitcoin. yeah. And in the middle, you've got Ripple and all sorts of other things. So those four kinds of ledger are good enough. So now, now I've got a little bit of specificity around things. So now when you say to me, we're going to put the Honduran land registry on the ledger. And people are saying this, by the way. We're going to put the Honduran land registry on the ledger. Now I can point to this and say, OK, when you say, on, show me what you mean. What's in the blocks, right? Are you talking about, a, for example, a double permissionless ledger? I mean, that would be ludicrous. That would be crazy to commit national resources onto something like that, where you've literally no idea where it could go in the future, right? So therefore, we want to put it on a double permissionless. Well, if we're going to put it on a double permission ledger, then you face Gideon's problem. If you're going to put it on double, why don't you just put it in a stupid database then? What's the point of a double permission ledger? I mean, I mean, there are reasons because of robustness and, and all sorts of things. Also, consensus forming, I, I'm skipping over this, but consensus forming inside companies is also quite problematical. Um, never mind reconciling between them. OK, so what are you going to do with that information? I'm going to show you that if you take on that, if you take that model on board, it gives you a different perspective of the shared ledger. <clears throat> so a fintech is about the private cost benefit of stakeholders. So if I'm a bank and I use a fintech, right, I do that because it makes things cheaper for me or I make more money or whatever, okay? A fintech is about private costs. That's not necessarily what a blockchain is all about. You know, maybe there are some circumstances where the use of a blockchain within an organization can reduce the cost. I frankly doubt that because I think in all circumstances, a database is going to be cheaper. I mean, that's the honest truth, right? So in all circumstances, a database is going to be cheaper. So there have to be some other reasons you want to use it. But we're speaking in very general terms. So let's go back to that problem that I spoke about at the beginning. Let's pick this out as a specific one. The great salad oil skin swindle with Tino. <clears throat> so how was that swindle executed, and how was it actually found out, and how would the blockchain have helped? So Tino and his guys had a very elaborate system for pumping water and oil from tank to tank. So the inspectors come round, and the inspectors say, yes, there's oil in that. Now, that it doesn't make any difference whether they're signing that on a piece of paper or putting it on a shared ledger. It doesn't make any difference. Like, once the blockchain says this tank is full of oil, that tank's full of oil now. You know, the blockchain isn't magic, much as some people would want you to believe. The blockchain, I said the other day, like, if we were playing Dungeons and Dragons, who plays Dungeons and Dragons in here? <laughs> My God, you're an imagine. I'm stunned at that. So none of you know what an eye of true seeing is. I can't use that joke. Oh, you do. Thank you very much. OK, so, so can I do the joke to you then? So the blockchain's a data structure. It's not an eye of true seeing, right? 
Yeah, see, he knows what I'm talking about. The blockchain's not magic. The blockchain doesn't know there's no salad oil in the tank, right? And once you've told the blockchain there is salad oil in the tank, that then becomes an immutable fact. How does the blockchain fix that problem? Well, the answer is it could have. And the reason it could have is because Tino's plan had a slight flaw which is only revealed in aggregate. So Tino had been getting loans for the salad oil that was in his tanks from American Express and from other people as well. And the total amount of oil that he got loans for in his tanks was more than the total production of the United States. <laughs> So all the individual lenders couldn't see. But had all of those records been in one place, it would have been immediately obvious, wait a second, there's more salad oil here than in the entire US. Perhaps we should send someone down to double check or something, right? It's the same thing with the horse meat, OK? The guy that got sent to jail, I think he was Polish, the guy that got sent to jail for putting 330 tons of horse meat into the supply chain, he just signed a piece of paper that says, oh, no, this isn't beef, this, is, uh, this isn't horse, this is beef. He signed a piece of paper. It doesn't matter whether it's on the blockchain. So now there's a thing on the blockchain that says this is, horse, uh, says this is beef. I keep getting it mixed up. <laughs> As, in fact, they did. <laughs> but you see what I mean? Like, the blockchain isn't fixing that. It, it doesn't fix the individual problem but it potentially does fix the aggregate problem. If it allows you to take a view of an industry as a whole, then it allows you to ultimately reduce the cost of that industry. So it's not about the individual cost of the individual stakeholders. It's about the kind of reg tech application, which is the cost of the industry as a whole. And, and if the if this new technology is going to introduce something revolutionary, it's going to introduce it in this space. And I want to use just one example to show why I think that's true. And it's a picture I love. I've quite often used this picture. So this picture here, that's from 1936, from Popular Mechanics in 1936. And it's a drawing. So in, in 1936, in the US, there, this is the era of Bonnie and Clyde and the Depression. And the big problem banks were facing was, um, was robberies, right? So in those days, the number one bank problem was robberies. But in those days, it was people who didn't work for the bank who were robbing them. So it was a very different kind of, <laughs> it's a very different kind of dynamic in those days. It involved guns and things. So people were coming up with all sorts of ways. How do we stop people robbing banks? And people were coming up with this, well, we make them out of concrete, and we put metal meshes around them, and we have iron bars for everything. We have machine gun turrets on all these kind of things. And this architect, Francis Keeley, this New York architect, he said no. He said the way we would stop people from robbing banks is to make them out of glass. And that's his drawing. He drew a glass bank. And he said, you can't rob a glass bank. Because if you walk in with a gun and try and hold somebody up, Everybody who's walking past can see what's going on, and then they can call the cops. So if you want to stop people from robbing banks, you don't make them out of concrete and steel and make them thicker. You make them out of glass. And I know it's a clumsy metaphor, but that's what the blockchain does in financial services. So if we want to fiddle about trying to reduce some little costs internally here and there, that's absolutely fine. And you'll do it by jamming the blockchain and shoehorning it and make it fit inside what we already do with databases. But if you want to do something revolutionary, it's going to change the financial services industry. It's by using it as a reg tech and bringing in a radical kind of transparency into the supply chains of all kinds, whether financial services or industrial or anything else. So, so please be more questioning about the stuff that you see written about blockchain. Most of it is bollocks. Um, <laughs> and please try to have more of a vision about what you're going to do with this amazing new technology. Thank you very much for listening.